Shay and Olivier in conversation with Deva Figueroa. Over to you. Hello, welcome to this session where I must issue a warning. We are going to make you very, very hungry. We're going to talk a lot about food. And you know, I thought the timing was very opposite because between breakfast and lunch, Bengalis really like to talk about food. For example, you know, that's true, but I sort of, you know, to, to plan the rest of the day. Yeah, should we begin? Yeah. Okay. Before we talk about the book, this gorgeously illustrated, brilliant book, and I will tell you, I have tried out some of the recipes, so I'm going to have, you know, questions for the chef. But before that, I wanted to sort of start there, that food that we eat is also a lot about food that we remember having eaten uh, from childhood, youth. So I'd like both of you to share memories of a very, very memorable, dramatic meal. It could have gone terribly wrong, but should we begin there? Why not? Um, so for me, I think uh, it, the memory is always, uh, it's a, always a bit mixed because I, I, we never went to restaurants. So uh, once in about you know, six months, my father would announce, we're going to go to a restaurant. And at that point, you know, uh, and this was already two weeks ahead of time, and we started drooling from then. There was two weeks of drooling. Of uh, and then uh, I, I remember there was a Chinese restaurant in Kolkata called Eros, um, long gone, um, near uh, Society Cinema. And it was, uh, and I remember at the age of seven going there and they had um, roast squab, and it was extraordinary. I mean, I, I don't know whether it was extraordinary or not. You were, I was seven. I never had Chinese food in my life, but it was a revelation. I must say that it, it was there in that moment that I realized that one day I'm going to write a cookbook. <laughs> not really, but, but, but right. almost. Right. Shen, what about you? Uh, my most recent memory of terrible meal one of the worst i've had was uh, when i arrived in china uh, i arrived in a, in a sort of um couch surfing where i met uh, two other uh, two other people and they were both chef in um what is this? in ibiza and they were doing a tour in uh, in china and uh we actually we ate so much because they were stopping in every strict strict street snack food and uh, and that doesn't go well with me so we spend one week together eating mostly every single minute of the day so when i left them i felt so so sick that i just ate pomelos for one week and then i the only meal i had was uh, somehow put in a plastic bag and it was very badly mildly cooked broccoli in a brown sauce and, and that was awful <laughs> So do you want to tell us how, um, Abhijit, do you want to tell us first how this book came to be? Oh, yeah. I mean, this book um, was sort of not meant to be a book. It was meant to be a, a present for my brother-in-law, Esther's brother. Why? He doesn't cook. He can't cook. He can cook. He likes to cook. He had been eating what I was cooking, and he liked it. And so his, his, he was keen to get the recipes and I thought, well, Christmas present, what do I do? I actually wrote a chapter and I decided that was his Christmas present. And, and I think what once you, and I, th I think the first thing you realize in trying to do that is it's extraordinarily boring writing recipes. Recipes are oh, God, not, yes. not interesting to write. So then I decided I had to be, do something to keep myself from falling asleep. And then I started to write text around the recipes and just find ways to amuse myself. So the goal right. was not to amuse anybody else, but me. I was, uh, if I were to had to continue, it had to be that there was some game that I was playing. Right. I decided that there was a, I had to launch a game. And the, the book, that, and then eventually I wrote more chapters for more Christmas presents for him. And then that was sort of the nucleus of the book. So just to tell our uh, audience here, 
what he means is that every recipe is prefaced by a little situation and it's it's funny it's sassy it's it's lovely and it sort of uh, occurred to me that there is a, a novelist lurking somewhere inside the economist and cookbook writer i i think i think this is i think my best length is six lines i think a novel won't work i think i'm very good i'm, I'm pretty a good novel at six, in six lines uh, yeah i'm chapters. pretty good at six lines but i don't think i will get very much further i think that, that takes more imagination than i have six lines i do well so this this is there's lots of introductions as she says some of them are 10 lines some of six lines but they they're good at six lines right so while chain tells us about how she came to be associated with this project do you want to find one of your favorite little six line 10 line things you're going to read it okay i'll read it oh. so this is going to be related to what each uh, uh, was saying what you were saying when i first read the book i think it was on a plane when uh, when we were in india just after the the nobel prize and um and I read the book and as an illustrator, what struck me was how you could somehow pair all the characters and scene of those little introductions. Mm -hmm. And you could have a whole story. I, I could picture a set of characters interacting. And that's why somehow we, we chose to illustrate the book rather than using photographs because- Absolutely. I thought that was a great uh, a, a sort of a conceptual thing as well, mm -hmm. because we are sort of uh, because of instagram because of all kinds of other media where people are constantly sharing food photos there is there is too much of food photography and as we know that food photography for cookbooks is usually it's not actually the cooked thing it's styled heavily and it's half cooked for the best photographs so you sidestep that all together with this brilliant concept the idea was to drive people away from what it should look like in the end other than the process of cooking and you've also cooked together do you want yeah. to tell us a bit about that well shen was our au pair so she was uh, she lived with us for three years with uh, you know picking up our children from school um, you know teaching them uh, how to draw and about life and so she, and but one of her I guess mostly voluntary, but may not be entirely voluntary responsibilities was to help me cook. And, and I think for a while that was mostly mundane stuff. But then uh, I realized that she was actually interested in and actually good at it. So there was a transition through, you know, when she would, and she's, she's very modest. So she would say, uh, can I do this part of it? And I say, yes, you can do all of it. Uh, Shane, what about you? What is the kind of food you ate growing up? And, um, and how has that changed? Uh, one thing that I noticed is that my, uh, my dad actually went to India in the, in the eighties by road. Ah, and right. There was a famous, uh, land route yeah exactly yes, Take, Istanbul. Uh, from brussels to yes. to delhi to goa and um so actually we ate a kind of dal <laughs> that a bit it made me uh, think about it we ate some sort of dal and we would sometimes eat it with the hands so that's something that i uh, find found back uh, living with esther and Abhijit. Uh, but mostly salads actually uh, the one uh, that is mentioned in the book in the book there is a secret chain salad exactly and the one i cooked for esther and abhijit when last year when we were in paris and we were the three of us were co-working <laughs> so every every lunch was yes, uh, yes. mostly a salad that salad. i would arrange quickly in 15 minutes of course um, it's a uh, it's in the book it's called chain salad but in fact it should be called chain salads because in fact it's it's a uh, it's a model for a salad, if you like, meaning you can choose a, a green, a fruit, a nut, a cheese, and then you combine them with a the dressing. So it is, everything is modular. So in principle, you could create as many types as you want. It's a, it's a family of salads. And so we, every day she would make one, but it was never the same. It was all, every day was a different admixture of these ingredients. Um, so when I was reading the book, I marked out chain salad as the one I aspire to, but the, but the recipe that I cooked from the book before um, our conversation was like a good Bengali girl. I made mangshur jhol and I followed the instructions to a T. That's something I love about the book, that it's, it's very precise. 
Um, I've struggled with some cookbooks in the past where, you know, in the, in the Indian tradition, we'll say that it's by andaz, you know, the, the, the cooks, they're so, they're such experts. They, so initially it was very, uh, it, it's uh, the, the novice cook has to make a lot of mistakes to learn what the andaz is, but this one actually will tell you teaspoon, tablespoon, but also by weight measure. So how did you actually, was, did you all run like a trial kitchen where you perfected the recipes? A little bit. I think many of the recipes, I mean, first, I mean, this book is really things that we do cook. It's not things that we, right. um, you know, these are not aspirational. They're mm. meant to be doable, easy, things that we made many, many times. So it's not, I think, Shane made many, many of them at a final trial without my help. So, so the, I, I think it's meant to be that. So and the quantities got adjusted along the way. So it's, it wasn't a, I mean, it, it was sort of a long-term project in that sense. Um, so should we take an audience question? We've got several, uh, yes? Perhaps. Ah, that's that's a writer, Balaji Vittal. Yes. Uh, my name my name is Shekhar. I'm a retired psychiatrist uh, with a plan to open a restaurant. It's going to be called Deep Freud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, Definitely my, coming the next time. My question to you, sir, is about the naming of dishes. And I'm sure Balaji would know that there's a dish in Kolkata called Koviraji Cutlet. Yeah. I'm given to understand that the etymology of the word Koviraji is coverage. Yeah. So I'd like to ask, so it's, it's about a coverage and it's been sort of uh, translated into Koviraji. So how do you name your dishes uh, in this book? And that's my question. It's an excellent question. I'm not imaginative about it. I, I you know, in retrospect, maybe I, I could have attributed, uh, more, I could have named them more imaginatively, but mostly they are very, they're pretty mundane dishes. I would not say that in within each culture, those dishes are actually standards. I, I think what the book does is it provides, uh, it kind of, it's meant to give you confidence to cook standards, not, not to do something extraordinarily. I mean, there's some, maybe 20% of the dishes are, things that I invented in one form or another, and the rest are just standards. And so I, I wouldn't say that there's a lot there that's, you know, you don't want to call, uh, you know, spaghetti bolognese something else. Uh, it would only offend. Uh, so in that sense, probably I didn't have much choice also. Right. Um, yes. We'll take Balaji's question and then one from, from there. Hello, yeah, Abhijita. My question is, you said there were either the very low street food ones or the big restaurants. Now, there were a few Bodhi's canteens and all those types in Kolkata. Uh, but maybe I get your point, those are few few and far between. Now, and not that high end either. Not there that were, high end. kind of grimy. Yes. Uh, I, I thought you the premium you paid over the pure street food was for being able to sit under a, a noisy fan. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than for the quality of the food. Uh, the quality of the food was roughly at the street standard. Right. Is that the blank space that was taken up by the South Indian restaurants? Because they were able to afford those semi-air conditioned, not fully air conditioned. They had two sections and there was a plethora of those. Do you think that was the space that the Bengali food could not occupy that the South Indian restaurants walked in and occupied? That's probably right. That they, was, they were still at, they were better quality, I would say, than the, uh, I don't know, I, I, this is my prejudice. I like South Indian food, so I, but I, I think the South, even the South Indian food, I wouldn't call that high end. It was, it was very basic and you, you, you know, they were not encouraging you to spend time there. They would come and after about two minutes, uh, come and say that, um, basically take your plate away before, almost before you finish so that you have a, to, so you can move on. High uh, throughput model, as they say. Yeah. I, exactly. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question and then we'll of course come back to the audience again. Hello, sir. 
So, uh, as the discussion was uh, going on, uh, uh, ma'am, you noticed, <coughs> you said that, you know, because of uh, people frequently eating out now and because of the easiness uh, of home deliveries and takeaways. So, sir, do you think that is leading to, uh, you know, a lack or at least a lessening of creativity for people to cook themselves? So, personally, I'll be honest, I, I hardly, I can hardly cook. I learned like four or five basic dishes during the pandemic. But even then, I felt that, you know, when I'm like at patience, like there's really a lot of potential and variety that you can have, especially in India where you have a host of flavors and, uh, you know, uh, other things to choose from. So what do you think? This is a good, no, good think, question. It's a nice question. I, I, I think it's, I, I think the, my, personally, I would say that uh, that should, would have, should enhance your ambition in the sense it's, it's, Precisely the fact that you don't have to do it every day that makes it even easier to to say that look you know today I'm going to do it. I, in many ways, I think at least for me, it's an extremely uh, wonderful way to transition out of my work day. So I, I literally come home. I never sit down. I start cooking the moment I come home, and I cook for an hour and a half without uh, right after that the reason i do it is because i do it every day essentially we almost we keeping my parental tradition we never go out so um and the but i think it's great way to get you know i know whatever you do for a living uh, you this is a way to get your brain out of that and right. into something else i i really love the fact that it's, you're doing something but it's using a very different part of the brain a very different part of your hands your hands are working in a way that you know as a professor my hands work but they work in a very specific and staccato way uh, and, uh, and this gives you just a different way of using your hands it, it, it's very very pleasant for me so i would say it's think of it as another way to unbend another way to use your leisure but it's also that then that's somehow what differentiates uh, just a, a, a mere assembly like a mechanical assembly of uh, whole ingredients into a, a meal I, I feel that uh, the way you cook at, at least is uh, you pay a lot of attention to the heat to how it looks so you you really have to focus on it and somehow that's what makes it good in the end and that's that's what changes it's not uh, uh, putting much more effort it's, it's mostly paying attention so what I'm curious about is uh, you exactly. know that what is your kitchen vibe? Okay, I'll tell you what mine is. I, the kitchen will look like a war zone. And at some point I will have a meltdown and my husband will have to kind of mop me up. Okay, and then the food will emerge from the kitchen at least a few hours um, past the time it was supposed to. It's very, very dramatic. What's your cooking? So I would do, say the positive and let Shen say the negative. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm pretty good at time. If I say a meal will be at 7.30, it'll be at 7.40 maybe, but not, I, I'm not, I'm good at time management. So if I calculate it's going to take take a certain amount of time, it'll, that, that'll be it. Uh, and then there is the war zone part of it, which I can't talk about. Uh, which is often uh, one of the kids <laughs> coming and uh, saying at the very last moment, I, I think five minutes before eating, that she she has a big project. She wants to make a dessert for everyone, and she looks so adorable that you can't say no. And of course, she's going to do everything on her own, but you, you'll have to <laughs> pay attention, and you may put a foot in the in the big bowl full of rice and water and I don't know yes. other greens and stuff that the other kid <laughs> put and 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 guests arrive so you uh, also want to entertain them but then you might as well use them in the kitchen in the cooking process so it, it's very it's very lively right um you know I think we should sneak in one serious question shouldn't we you know, You're the uh, boss. Uh, so as an economist, you've, you, you've said uh, in the beginning of the book that, you know, economics comes from ukumania, yes, which is the management of household expenses. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have a terrible relationship with economics. <laughs> that um, so how do you, you know, when you write about food, you're also um, a social scientist, you've traveled to some of the poorest homes, eaten with them. Some of those stories come across too. 
Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I think that in a oblique way, this is a book of social science. I, 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 I don't, don't want to disown my connection to social sciences. Indeed, it's a book of social science. It is, uh, there's a, um, I mean, I've, I think I eventually, uh, my original instinct was to say that, you know, this is going to become overly pompous and therefore I'm going to cut that all out. But in fact, both Chiki, who is our editor and Shane uh, said, no, you should put your social scientist back in there. And the book, it does have, and, I, and I'm, I was persuaded, it was good advice. And I think what it does is it gives a book a layer that we wouldn't have had otherwise, which is how to think about all the kind of the social challenges around Absolutely. food. And you know, the, the diversity challenges, the challenges of and the environment, all kinds of issues come up. And e right. so we have a section on each of them right. in the book, uh, not, hopefully not a tedious one, two pages, usually relatively lighthearted. But I think, so I do think that what the arguments we make there, and I, I say we advisedly, because a lot of the, those arose out of conversations with Shane. Um, hmm. I think that those, are, I do believe in what, what we say there. It's not right. just a gesture. Right, right. And it's very impactful, that little anecdote about the experiment in Switzerland on, on bankers. No, yeah, bankers, bankers, and, bankers. bankers and humans. That was quite telling and, and clever. But uh, Shane, you're vegetarian. Um, we do have a significant section of meat and seafood in, in the book, um, because obviously, uh, as a... a as a good Bengali, you've written about it, that, you know, if you invite somebody, you'll say, come and have dal bhat with me. But obviously, it's not going to be dal bhat. There will be like three kinds of fish and uh, mutton and uh, five kinds of dessert. And even the guests will be super insulted if it's only dal bhat. They'll be <laughs> like, at least you should have made an omelette. I've heard this. <laughs> so... Um, do you want to just share that little experiment about the bankers and the humans and how there's a little nudge concealed there about how we can influence people who eat meat to think sustainably about it? Yeah, so I, I, the point of that experiment uh, is, was, I, it's a beautiful experiment. It's, uh, in, so what they did, and I'll, I'll say the experiment and then draw the, uh, draw the connection. So the experiment was they, they invited um, a bunch of bankers, all of them were bankers, um, Swiss bankers, you know, famously, uh, and they invited them in to do an experiment and they told them that the experiment is very simple. You go into a room, uh, you toss a coin, I don't remember, 50 times, something, and you report, nobody's watching you, there's no camera, you report what fraction of the coins were heads. And you get paid more if you have more heads. Okay? So you could imagine that that creates certain temptation to over-report heads. In fact, uh, and so what they that was deliberate. It was not that this was they had noticed that this was a, there was a temptation. The the point of the experiment was that half of those bankers were told uh, to discuss their role as citizens. What do you do in the weekend? Do you help out? Do you do, do you know, other things that were kind of, they were prime, primed on their role as citizens. The other half were primed on their role as bankers. And if you look at the citizens, essentially on average, tell the truth. They don't really lie, they don't exaggerate. These are, remember, they're all bankers. It's not that they're, it's bankers who were reminded they're citizens and bankers who were reminded they're bankers. When, when you remind them that they're bankers, they start to cheat. <laughs> Why do I bring this in? It's because it's, a, it's an experiment which shows that our sort of, I think the idea that we are somehow unable to deliver on, you know, change our preferences is just meaningless. We, don't, we aren't even one person. We are the person who is the banker, and we are the person who's the banker who's reminded he's a citizen. Or she's a citizen. So there's and, this sort of social construct about food and so food and our into. preferences. And yes, it's our our you know I I cannot 
endure this or that or the other. I am a Bengali and I have to have my fish every day or whatever. All of these things are constructs. And I, I think that the more we let ourselves believe that we are, these are essential, the, the more they get reinforced. I, I want us to examine what is Absolutely. really essential. Absolutely. And so Shane, uh, you grew up, uh, I think I was watching in some other interview, you grew up in a very sort of carnivorous environment and you became vegetarian. So at, at what age did you make that? Choice? I actually didn't become vegetarian. I was raised vegetarian. So oh. I never uh, ate meat. I, I, I tried meat before fish, etc. But the taste is so strong that I, I really, I, I can't eat it every day. But actually meeting, I said, I did made me um, a bit more flexible on that because so since I grew up in a, in an environment that could eat cold cuts basically at every meal, mm. uh, then I had to become a bit ideological to, to make my point, to, to justify the fact that I was not eating um, meat or fish. And, and I also see some friends who from one day to the other, they decide they, they are going to become vegetarian and they're hyper strict about it. And a few weeks after, they are just uh, uh, yes, they just they fall off to, the wagon exactly. So I'm and Abhijit made me actually try many kinds of fishes and meat. So I can now I can eat it from time to time. But again, I but mostly I, I become uh, right. more uh, me. So I I really think that there is a in between to reach, uh, and that actually and being too ideological about it can just have the Opposite effect. Absolutely. So we'll take maybe one or two audience questions and then let me tell you I have a rapid fire round. Okay. This is your time to prepare for the rapid fire round. Both of you. Okay, Very right. easy questions. Right. All right. Shall we take some one question from the back, please? I feel like we've maybe from a woman. I see. So far. Yes, please. Only men. So, uh, hi, Abhijit. Hi. Neva Priya, uh, I can corroborate everything that Abhijit talked about being a poor graduate student in the United States because we were poor graduate students together. And uh, I, had the, I had the pleasure of actually eating his cooking and he had the misfortune of eating mine because, you know, we used to cook quite a lot. So my question to you, Abhijit, I've, I have your book, I've read it. Um, you have so many cuisines from around the world. Which for you was the most... Uh, interesting, the one that made you think, you know, I, you grew up as an Indian, which, uh, which made you think about cooking? I think Italian. I think Italians, what they do brilliantly is, you know, uh, realize that if you pick the right vegetable at the right time, it doesn't take anything else to give a, to that plus some cheese and you can have a wonderful meal. I, I, I think that's an extraordinary, or even just a nut. I mean, I make pasta with just pistachio and it's, it's wonderful. And you don't need anything else. It's just pistachio, little garlic, chili, and cheese. And it, it's wonderful. Uh, so it's, I think the Italian appreciation of the essential, you know, quality, high quality ingredients, which are in season, are extremely tasteful. Can, you know, they make pasta with just fresh tomato and basil and olive oil. You just chop it up, don't cook it. You put, cook the pasta, don't make a sauce, just dip the pasta, put the pasta in a bowl, cut the best tomatoes in season, which uh, you still have now in, in India, just the end, end of the season. Some basil, some ga garlic, chopped fine, some olive oil and some salt and just let it sit for 20 minutes and you have a wonderful dish. And it, it, that's the brilliance of Italian cooking. I think the idea that ingredients don't dominate, don't dominate it with other flavors. Don't need, you don't need meat, you don't need, uh, you don't need uh, you know, many spices. They do use spices and they use them very uh, sharp often. It's often quite spicy, calabrese cooking, for example, is very spicy, but it's, it's not, it's never, uh, never dominated by, uh, you know, the spices. So it's, 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 it's a very, um, I, I learned a lot from the sort of the way they think about food. Right. But somehow, somehow it connects to another uh, idea that runs for the wood, which is the idea of pleasure that is uh, going to actually make us 
uh, eat in a more environmentally friendly uh, way because if you eat the right vegetable at the right time then not only it's going to be uh, environmentally compatible but it's also going to be extremely good and this is not by by setting some very strict rule to yourself and to others that uh, you're going to bring more people uh, into changing their preferences exactly so i i think it's it's exactly right that i think the i think seasonality is such a i mean it's something that the in the us they basically try to make you forget by getting food from everywhere but of course you don't forget it because the, the, when something's in season right. it tastes better right right uh yes this uh, the lady here okay thank you thank you very much you're welcome thank you <laughs> Now, food and economics is related, connected. It's always there. It's so many layers. You don't even have to go abroad like we do, even in India from its borders across. Could you give us, as an economist, as a Nobel Prize economist, a cutting insight into the relationship of today's landscape of the availability of food, availability, and it's, in fact, it's too much of it sometimes, and to the economics. I mean, we all know traditionally, as you said, seasonal food was the thing. This is what our grandparents did. This is how we all grew up. And this is what we know about it. That's why I said there's so many layers. I think, uh, Dev Priya, we could have a half a day of session on just uh, food, food and economics. It's not about cooking and recipes. It's much more than that. And I think there is a session on food yes. and so economics. So could you please? So uh, I think this the book has a fair amount of this discussion and I'm not going to be, uh, it's, it's too big a topic, as you say. I'll, I'll give you one example that's uh, in the book, but I think is actually interesting. So if you, the US has a, a tradition of uh, eating, I would say this is a slightly unfair, but not very unfair, of eating large, very large quantities of very bad quality meat. That's your, your median meal comes with a lot of meat, and of no great quality, both I think uh, slightly depressing. Especially, you know, you get a lot, but you throw it away, and it does, doesn't taste good while you eat it. And I think it's a result of a particular sociological phenomenon, which is that the U.S. was pre-populated by immigrants, poor immigrants from Europe. Poor immigrants in Europe lived on didn't get meat. This was a culture where meat was too expensive. Uh, meat prices fall by. 60% between uh, when the steamship is uh, this the air condition air the the refrigerated steamship is introduced uh, so before that meat prices are very expensive europe poor people eat gristle parts of bone and right. and tender right. and so when they found the meat it was just so much celebration that the us culture became centered around meat and in particular for example parts of the us like texas don't actually grow very much it's a place where you know you the only form of farming that was possible and you see that a lot in the westerns is uh, is the texas longhorn which is a cow that can live on basically cactuses and but the meat is not tender as a result so you end you end up getting this very low quality meat but then plenty of it and in fact nothing else grows so you eat a lot of meat so I, I think the connection between the history and the geography the history of immigrants coming from europe with a history of not being able to eat meat suddenly seeing meat is very cheap they're writing home uh, to their uh, to their family saying look i ate meat every day last week uh, and right. so this celebration and the geography the fact that texas really didn't go that frames of what we can eat. And I think that's one of the one of the points that sort of we make in some detail. Right, right. Okay, We've, we don't have much time, so we have to do our rapid fire round very rapidly. <laughs> okay, so the same question for both of you, and you have to answer very quickly. Okay. You start with Chen, so Chen gets an answer. No, I'm going to start with you, so that Chen gets a little bit of time to prepare. Yes, worst cooking disaster. I made a manga uh, mache jhol once. The first time I made it, I made it, made it with cod. And cod is unlike, let's say, rui, is, is a very watery fish. So if you do what you do, do with rui, which is 
pre-fry it and then put it in a sauce, it kind of crumbles into uh, uh, like breadcrumbs. It becomes like breadcrumbs. And it, 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 has, it was the most awful thing I've ever eaten, I think, in my life. Very good rule. Never make matcha jhol with cod. Shien? Uh, me and my sister, we were trying to uh, do muffins for friends and eventually became into a sort of uh, lava that we gave to the to the dog. But my sister eventually became a, a pastry chef okay, at the Ritz in Paris. So that's not, uh -huh. she leveled up from there. Yes, she really picked so herself up from that early <laughs> You can crisis. recover from disaster. Yes. Okay, next question. A meal that you cooked that got you a date. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can eat, I mean, you can I, I, I think uh, I think you got the order backwards. <laughs> I think you invite someone to a, a meal and you cook for them. Then mm. whether that gets you another date, I don't know. That's... You already managed to uh, get them come once. <laughs> so I think you're getting the causality mixed up. Uh, I actually made the, uh, the recipe from the book, the fennel pasta works very well. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and the egg in a cube. Right? So I tried them all. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Favorite novel about food or favorite novel that talks about, I love novels that go on and on about food. Uh, hmm, hmm. Or a favorite book about food, we can extend uh, it a bit. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, yes, book. yes. Uh, then I go. Uh, and that actually uh, inspired the, this book. It's the, the Grammar of Spices by the designer Kaz Hildebrand. Um, in, uh, published in Thomson Hudson. That was very mm -hmm. much a, an inspiration. She paired uh, uh, information about spices with the work of Owen Jones, uh, an architect from the 19th century. Uh, it's oh, a beautiful book. Poddanodir Maji. Uh, this is a Bangla novel by Manik Bandhubatai. Um, there's a scene where the, the, the fishermen are cooking the fish, the caught fish, and they're cooking it in in the boat, boat. Uh, and she, he gives the entire recipe in there it's simple it has i it, love novels which do that which also you know yeah yeah it, it, it yes. provides a recipe in it it's it, even if you not interested in the food part of it it's a novel worth reading it's extraordinarily good novel it's translated now in, in english as well it's really extraordinarily good novel um, okay I'm letting you off really easy. Okay, there's only one last question now for both of you. Thank God. Uh, three economists you would invite for dinner. They could be from any time, you know. Uh, and what would you cook for them? And artists in your case, Shan. Um, who would I invite? Uh, I think Adam Smith. I think Adam Smith had a really good sense of life. John, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, so those are easy. The third one, uh, hard, uh, because economists are not famous for their, uh, you know, sense of life. I would say, it's not, alas. <laughs> so. Uh, so I mean, tell us what you'd cook for Adam Smith and what you'd cook for Keynes. Oh, no, no, I'm going to cook one meal. I'm not about to. I, they're all coming for dinner it's together. <laughs> oh, okay. It's also going to be a very loud dinner then, and they'll all be disagreeing. So who's the third then? Uh, I, 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 I just inv invite um, Kenneth Arrow, who's the 20th century economist I admire the most. So uh -huh. I'll, I'll invite. I don't, I don't know whether he like. I don't know. I haven't met any of these people. But, yeah. I met Ken, Ken many times, but not any yeah. other, not the other. But this just reminds me that Keynes was part of the Bloomsbury set, yes, right? Yes. And there is a Bloomsbury cookbook. Yes. So yeah, I yeah, think he'd so, enjoy. I think he'd probably. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He was British from the 1930s. I, 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 forgive me if I'm sound prejudiced, but I don't know. How, how, but what would I cook? Uh, I think I would cook since. Two of them are British. Uh, you know, there's some a recipe. The dessert is easy. Cheetah's trifle. I think cheetah's trifle is, um, I suspect they were all meat eaters. So I'll, I'll make the tagliata. It works extraordinarily well with meat eaters. Uh, and before that, I think I'm going to make uh, a soup. Um, the 
I think the uh, the famine the, soup because they're sorry? too British. Uh, the famine soup, no, and uh, that's for the that's it's for a very people nice that don't, don't like. Uh, um, uh, the the I think the tomato uh, and and potato soup will go very well with this. It's again, it's this is all imagining happening in the late summer when the tomatoes are good uh, and the potatoes are good. So the tomato with a uh, walnut pesto, the uh, tomato and and uh, potato soup with the walnut pesto. And uh, finally, the uh, so I have to finish quickly. And finally, a pasta uh, to, to lead into it, a pasta with um, a, a simple pasta with cauliflower and and uh, nuts and raisins and a sort of Arabic inspired pasta from Sicily. Aha, uh -huh, that's a very fancy meal. Okay, I wish I were. You're invited. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Shane, what about you? Um, I think I would invite um, female artists who do geometric abstraction, like um, Ilma Afkins, Sophie Tarabab, or Barja mm -hmm. And I, I think I would pre-cut everything into geometrical shapes, and then we would assemble it together. Oh, <laughs> that would be a, a creative dinner possibility. Right. Uh, unfortunately, I know we could have gone on for a long time. We are out of time. So um, I'm going to thank Abhijit and Shane for this absolutely wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Devo Priya. You were wonderful. <laughs>